I'm Brandon Scroggins, a pastor here at Reformation Baptist Church, and we are so thankful that you've stopped here to check out the content, which is such a central part of the life of our church. We truly believe that there is hope for you right now in Christ. At RBC, we believe that it's vital to worship God, to disciple one another, and to be a witness to the world, to pierce every area of life, every nation and generation with the good news of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We believe that it's essential to teach sound doctrine in the context of our homes through family worship, and then to gather in corporate worship on the Lord's day and as we can throughout the week as well. You see, at the heart of man's need is the exposition of God's holy word, taking one passage and one verse at a time, understanding it the way God intended it, and then applying it to the whole of life. The content here is made available to church members who are providentially hindered from joining us in person at the time. But it's so vital that you stay connected to the life and leadership of the church. But this content is also made available for anyone else outside of our church that would find it helpful. But we want you to know that as glad as we are that you stopped here and are joining us online, I am not yet your pastor and we are not yet your local church. Scripture teaches that it's vital that every person know Christ and then for every believer to be anchored in physical presence into the life of the local church, submitting themselves under the care of faithful, qualified pastors who can shepherd your soul. So I want to encourage you to find and join a local church, if possible, a solid Reformed Baptist church. And if you're not already a part of a faithful, biblical local church, we want to encourage you to come and join us in person as soon as possible. We pray that the content here is a blessing to your soul. The glory be to Christ. God bless you. Thank you, Brian. And we have a transition class for our younger children. If uh, you would like to be a part of that, you're more than welcome to, uh, to head that way. If whoever is taking that would help initiate that. Contrary to my normal practice, we are extending our series through the book of Ezra one more week to address a topic that I was assigned to study and preach on in a different context. And I want to speak on this particular concern for us today. And I want to do that not because I see this as an issue in our church, uh, but I do see this as an important issue mentioned throughout God's Word. And since this does not seem to be a major issue for us at this point, perhaps this would be a good time to trace out scripture in this particular area. You say, which area? I want to ask all of the children to look up here at me. And I want to pose a riddle for you as we get started. And here is the riddle. Everyone has it, unbeliever and believer. It lives within you every single day. It can be your greatest comfort, or it can be your greatest nightmare. It must be trained or it will lead you astray. You can use it or you can abuse it. And it is definitely one of the most important parts about you. And my question to you is, what is it? Who said these famous words? What great theologian said this? Sit down, son. Now you see the world is full of temptation. Temptations? Yeah, temptations. There are the wrong things that seem right at the time, but uh, even though the right things may seem wrong sometimes, sometimes the wrong things uh, may be right at the wrong time or uh, vice versa. Understand? Then I'm going to do right. boy, Pinocchio, and I'm going to help you. Who could ever forget the story of Pinocchio? And what's interesting in that story is that this puppet becomes a so-called boy. But the more that this boy crosses his conscience, the more the boy, and in fact, begins to become like a beast. And even to the point, at one part in the story, he begins to have ears come out of his head and a tail sprouts out from his backside. But the principle behind the entire story is one that has become encapsulated in our culture. And the principle I would like for you to help me finish. Always let what? 
conscience be your guide. But is that true? Should we always let our conscience be our guide? Perhaps nothing within us is more powerful in life and for all eternity than this often neglected concern of the conscience. The title of my message is Glorifying and Enjoying God with Your Conscience. Well, how does this apply to our day and why should we consider this issue? Well, number one, Scripture speaks abundantly of this issue. But number two, we live in a day of forced masking and forced vaccines. We live in a day of church closures and debates over whether the church is actually even essential. We've seen a person's entire livelihood and churches at stake over issues that are normally put in the bucket in our day of conscience. We can list a thousand other hot button items that have been hammered out and put in this bucket. Honestly, I chuckle when I think about it because I think, what about the good old days when all that we fought about was just really non-heated, non-controversial things like drinking and dancing and card playing and forms of dress and what to do and not to do on the Sabbath. All of a sudden, those days seem like child's play compared to the issues that we have been faced with today. Does it matter what we do with our conscience? Can we do whatever we want to do as long as it's within our conscience? What did the scriptures say? The scriptures paint this concern in a live issue in the first century that we'll touch on. But the issue is one that we might not be so easily able to relate to. Many of us are not confronted with whether or not we should go into a pagan temple and eat food or meat that had been sacrificed to an idol. But we have always, as a church, over the last 2,000 years, faced the concerns and principles before us. We see governments wrongly intrude into the consciences of the people of a nation. They refuse to punish what's evil and protect what's good. We see churches wrongfully neglect the conscience and then present stumbling blocks to one another over issues of conscience. We see families live in a state of a guilty conscience before God and for, before one another. And friends, most importantly, I wonder how many people have lived for decades, plagued in their conscience, maybe even to the point of being institutionalized, living in slavery, doing everything they can to appease a guilty conscience, to bury their conscience, to be misled by their conscience, and living in the straitjacket of fear and anxiety and guilt and shame. I remember Dr. Bob, before he passed, came up to me after a sermon, and we began to talk about an issue that was plaguing his heart at the time, and it was this issue of the conscience. And our conversation led me to believe that he thought that the issue of the conscience could be one of the most defining issues of our day. I chuckled, and I thought, how hard can it be? We all know what a conscience is. And then I begin to study the conscience, and I begin to realize I think that he is probably right. I want to especially encourage all of our children to listen. And I want you to look up here at me again, all of our children. So if you're a father and just, just kind of tap your children and help them to be engaged, I want to give you a very clear assignment this morning. I want to ask you three questions, and I want to encourage you to consider these three questions and then see if you can find the answer to at least one of them and then share the answer with your parents afterwards and then come up, and I would love to hear what you come up with. I'm going to give them to you really fast, so I hope you're listening. What is the conscience? Why do we need the conscience? How do we train the conscience? What is the conscience? Why do we need the conscience? How do we train the conscience? For all of us together, I want to take up this issue in three bold points if you're taking notes. And the first that I want to look at is the conscience in Christian thought. Number two is the conscience in God's word. And number three is the conscience in the Christian life. How can we glorify God and enjoy him with our consciences? 
I truly believe that this issue is bigger than most of us realize. Let's begin, number one, with the conscience and Christian thought. And I understand that as we approach this issue, many of us have specific concerns in our mind. Some of us may be thinking, is the preacher going to tell us that we can drink alcohol or is he going to tell us to stay a million miles away from it? I don't know what the issue in your mind is, but I do want you to know right out of the bat that my intent from the scriptures is to stay at the level of principle and then on an individual level, oftentimes it's more helpful to deal with specific issues. Is there any help from us from the history of God's people trying to work out this particular issue. What about in the early church? In the second century, a man by the name of Aristides wrote wrote an apology, a defense to Emperor Hadrian. And he's writing about the reputation of early Christians right after the pinning of scripture and what their witness looked like before a watching world. And he said this, and I quote, they do not commit adultery or fornication nor bear false witness, nor embezzle what is held in pledge, nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother and show kindness to those near to them. And whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They obey the commands of their Messiah with much care, living justly and seriously as their Lord and God commanded them. They sought to live in such a way that their conscience and their conduct would mirror one another and that they would live in good conscience before God and man. We move to the Reformation period and the famous words from Martin Luther ring out in our heads, unless I am convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, Luther said, I cannot recount. For my, what church family? Conscience is held captive by the word of God and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Luther staked his entire life on standing firm on a conscience convicted and conformed to the authority of scripture and it emboldened him to stand before kings. Calvin said a good conscience then is nothing but inward integrity of heart. He said it's a sort of guardian appointed for man to note and spy out all of his secrets that nothing may remain hid in darkness. The Puritans wrote on the conscience in our confession of faith, the London Baptist Confession, it says this, God alone is Lord of the conscience and he has left it free from human doctrines and commandments that are in any way contrary to his word or not contained in it. In other words, it's a dangerous thing to bind the conscience and we must make sure that it's bound according to the dictates of Holy Scripture. So children, here's your nod for your first question. What is the conscience? Well, we speak of consciousness and we refer to a level of awareness. We speak of being conscientious and we mean to be governed by conscience. But what do we mean when we use the word conscience. It's referred to in the original Latin from which the word comes from. It literally refers to a knowledge that's shared probably between God and man or between man and God's law. I would define the conscience as the inner faculty to accuse or to excuse our thoughts and our actions. Jeff Pollard defines it this way. It's the ability of our understanding by which we are internally aware of right and wrong. The best way I know how to illustrate is just to be very transparent with you and tell you about some massive issues that we have had in our home over the last couple of years. Sometimes you may see my smile and you may think, ah, they have it all together. What a sweet family. But I would just say you really don't know us at all, do you? An issue that we've had in our home and that is probably demonic possession is that we have had a smoke alarm going off in our house. The only time it goes off is about 1.30 in the morning and why, I do not know. Well, the first time or two it went off and you know the sound, you are up when that thing starts screaming. You can be the hardest sleeper on the planet and you're not anymore. 
And you get up, you search the house, and then we realize that that alarm is a wonderful blessing and we thank God for it when the house is on fire. But not only is the house not on fire, there's not even any smoke and there's clearly no problems anywhere in the entire house. So here we are again, 1.30 in the morning. Why is the alarm going off? You see, it illustrates the issue of conscience. It's a divine alarm system within us, and when it functions properly according to Scripture, it goes off and it screams within us, warning and danger, don't go there, beware. But the conscience can be misinformed and it can go off when there is, in fact, no danger, which is why it's so important that it conform to the dictates of Scripture. The Puritans called it God's spy, God's deputy and his judge. They called it his accuser and his executioner. They called it God's witness. They said it's like a spiritual nervous system. It's God's register laying out our sins. It's his sergeant going after them. They said that it can work as either a prosecutor to condemn us in our sins or as a defense attorney to acquit us in Christ before God. We see an explosion of writings on the conscience during the days of the Puritans where they pastorally applied their truths to the local church. A.W. Pink said that the conscience can be the best of friends or the worst of enemies. But number two, I want us to get quickly now to where we need to be, and where we need to be is the conscience in God's Word. Not only the conscience in Christian thought, but more importantly, the conscience in God's Word. Depending on which translation of the Bible you use, you may not see, at least in the Old Testament, hardly any references to the word conscience. But what we need to understand is that in the Old Testament, when we read the word heart, a lot of times what's indicated is what we understand by the word conscience. Depending on the translation of the Bible, you use over 30 times in the New Testament, we strictly see the word conscience. But that's not even counting the multitudes of references that explain the idea without using the exact word. So what I want to do is I want to take us on a marathon sprint through all of the explicit references of the conscience, some in the old, mostly in the new. And when we get done, if you're trying to note all of these, this is fixing to stress you out. I'm just telling you on the forefront. I'm not trying to exegete every verse. I'm doing big picture perspective. Let's just do a survey and run through so many different ways that Scripture addresses this issue. 1 Samuel 24, 5 in the New American Standard says that David's conscience bothered him. The ESV says his heart struck him when he cut off the robe of King Saul. 1 Samuel 25, 31 says David saved, was saved by a lady named Abigail that he might not later have pangs of conscience by sinning against God. Genesis chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, King Abimelech took David's wife, but he didn't know that she was David's wife, and so he did it, even though he was wrong, with a clear conscience. Verse or rather, 2 Samuel 24, 10 tells, that, tells us that David's conscience troubled him because he took a census of all of the people when he should have been trusting God to provide. Job 27, 6 says, I will cling to my conscience as long as I live. I will not allow it to accuse me of evil because I will not walk in wickedness. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 2 says, you are on, my, on their lips, but you are far from their conscience. I want to zero in and look at two instances that are very striking, or at least a few, maybe even a few in the Old Testament. First of all, you remember Adam in the garden. When Adam rebelled against God and he and his wife sinned in the garden, 
The Bible says that they were naked, they hid, and they were ashamed. And the reason was is because they had sinned against God and God was striking their conscience to show them that they were guilty. I will oftentimes very gently and tenderly share with my children when they're in sin in order to help train them. I'll say, do you feel guilty about what you have done? And they'll say, yes, I do. And I'll say, do you know why you feel guilty? No, Daddy, why do I feel guilty? Because you are, in fact, guilty. And we know what to do with our guilty consciences, and we'll unpack that later. Moses killed a man and ran, and he fled in his guilty conscience. What about Joseph? How many of you remember the life of Joseph? Joseph was thrown in a hole and left for dead by his own brothers, and then he was sold into slavery. In God's marvelous providence, do you remember how God sent him ahead to Egypt in one of the highest ranking houses in the country, only decades later to have his brothers end up going to Egypt and God's marvelous providence, God used what the enemy meant for evil to kill Joseph to save the life of his family. But before we get there, do you remember in the book of Genesis when the Bible says that they were struggling and wrestling with the circumstances before them and it began to strike their consciences, is God repaying us for what we did years later to our brother? How many people live with a plagued conscience, not washed in the blood of Christ and dealt with according to Scripture? And it plagues them for years. Joseph, in turn, would flee from an immoral woman with a good conscience, and he would say, how can I do this and sin against God? Turn with me in your Bible to 1 Samuel 17. Let's look at another example. 1 Samuel 17, verse 17 and following. Not only Joseph, what about David? David was sent out by his father to the army of Israel. His father had commissioned him to take food to his brothers and his commanding their commanding officer. His brothers were part of the enemy of Israel and they were facing off against the Philistines when one giant came forward that, by the name of Goliath. David is just a little shepherd boy. He seems to be just doing what his father has told him to do. But in 1 Samuel 17, his oldest brother Eliab looks at him and says, why have you come out here? You're just a spiritual show-off. You just want to see what's going on. You just want to get glory for yourself in the battle. Now, I want to be very clear. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I think that there is evidence that could lead us to believe that what is going on here is something that we need to be aware of ourselves. Because it appears that David is doing what his father told him. But it also may be that David's oldest brother does want, in fact, glory for himself. And the lesson here for us is that we want to be very careful because we can have guilty consciences and then we can, in turn, read our sins into other people. How easy is it for us to have a play conscience, to have sin in our hearts, and then we begin to read that sin into the motives of the other people around us because of a guilty conscience? A guilty conscience needs no this is really one of those times where I was hoping we could do this together. A guilty conscience needs no accuser. David cries out in Psalm 109, 22, for I am poor and needy and my heart is stricken within me. The book of Proverbs is a crash training course in how to rightly and wisely apply knowledge and use the conscience. Look with me in Acts chapter 23, verse 1, and then 
I want to do a marathon survey through the rest of the New Testament with every use of the word conscience. Paul says in Acts 23, 1, Paul told the rulers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. In Acts 24, 16, Paul said, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and men. Romans 2.15 says that the law is on their hearts. In other words, even unbelievers have the conscience with the law of God on their hearts and conscience that witnesses against them, either accusing them of evil or excusing them in anything that is good. Romans 9.1, Paul said, I am not lying. I am speaking the truth. My conscience bears witness to the fact. Romans 13.5 says, be in submission to governing authorities for the sake of conscience. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is a pivotal passage. And what it teaches us is that we are not to use the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ to the harm of other brothers and sisters in Christ. For 2 Corinthians 1.12, Paul says that he has behaved to the testimony of his conscience in simplicity and godly sincerity. 2 Corinthians 4.2, in an open statement of the truth, Paul said, we commend ourselves before God in every way, to everyone's conscience. 2 Corinthians 5.11, what we are known, what we are is known to God and in fear, we pray that this is plain to your conscience as well. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. This is a passage that I'd like for us to see together because Paul is dealing with false teachers that are promoting false doctrine in the church. He's correcting that or charging Lieutenant Timothy to correct that. And then he spells out in 1 Timothy 1, 5, the, the goal. He says, the aim of our charge is love that issues. This is what we want to see as a church. This is the goal. This is what we're shooting for. It's love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Boy, that'll sweeten and strengthen a congregation, won't it? 1 Timothy 1.19, fight the fight holding faith and a good conscience by which some have rejected and made shipwreck. Did you know in 1 Timothy 3, 9 that it is required of those who serve in the office of deacon that they must hold to the mystery of the faith with a good conscience? 1 Timothy 4, 2, Paul speaks of demonic teaching. And in the church, what it's doing is it's searing the consciences of the people into rejecting that which God calls good. 2 Timothy 1.3, Paul thanks God and he prays for the church with a clear conscience. Titus 1.15 speaks of a defiled mind leading to a defiled conscience, staining everything that a person touches. Hebrews chapter 9 says that it is the blood of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, through the eternal covenant that alone purifies our guilty consciences before God. Hebrews 10 says, let us draw near, not with timidity, not hesitating, not with slumped shoulders and a head bent down. Let us draw near with confidence, with hearts that have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies being washed by his spirit. Friends, we are the people who hold the words of eternal life. We know what to do with a guilty conscience. Is your conscience guilty before God this morning? 
Take it to the foot of Jesus Christ and his cross. Repent and believe the gospel. Trust in him. Drown your conscience in that fountain that we sang about that is filled with blood that is drawn from the veins of our Savior because he has went all the way to and through the cross, been raised from the dead to cleanse our guilty consciences. We can live with a clean conscience before God. But we ought to cultivate daily our consciences from weeds that defile. Question 36 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks my favorite question because it comes with my favorite answer. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? So from the rest of you that are from slop out like I am, let me just break this down. If you're saved, what, what's good about it? The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification. In other words, if you're saved, this is some of the fruit of it. Assurance of God's love. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Increase of grace perseverance to the end, and peace of conscience. Do you have a peace of conscience this morning? Or do you smile, but underneath that smile is waters that are troubled and raging in your soul? Did you know that you can leave here with peace of conscience? Children, I want to give you another nod because we need to think now about how do we train the conscience? How do we train the conscience? Isaiah 5.20 warns us against calling that which is evil is good. And it warns us against calling that which is good evil. And these things must be straightened out in our conscience and the reason is, is because we can sear or callous our consciences. So we want Scripture to accuse us by calling sin, sin, and we want Scripture to excuse us by comforting us and that which is not sin but good. You say, I come in here with a clean conscience. Consider this. Once Queen Mary told John Knox when challenged about her faith, I quote, but my religion is acceptable to my conscience. To which John Knox replied, and I quote, right conscience demands right knowledge and right knowledge, ma'am, you have none. I'm telling you right now, if I could be on a fly on the wall at any point in church history, son, put me on that wall because I would love to watch that unfold. Because she had a clean conscience that was guilty and living in sin and not conformed to the dictates of Scripture, and that is a very dangerous place to be. Romans 2.15 says that everywhere man has the law of God inscribed on his heart. Instinctively, all men have an intuitive sense of right and of wrong. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to remind you that we live in a fallen world and one part of what sin does is it messes up our hearts, our minds, and our consciences. And I want to really warn us, and I especially this morning want to warn our children and our grandchildren to be very careful in the little things about crossing your conscience. Because did you know that the more you cross your conscience, the easier it gets to do it again? And what can happen is you can begin to callous your conscience. Anybody here have calluses on their hands? If you were here yesterday, you do. I'm telling you that right now. What happens to hands that are callous is over time, you lose all sense of feeling. And that can happen as we have seared consciences living in sin, no longer informed rightly according to Scripture. So a conscience ought to work in a way that condemns us, 
in sin that turns us rather from sin and that urges us and comforts us in peace and assurance of the truth. So there you have it. There's an overview of every use of that word in the New Testament. You say, does that wrap it up? Not a bit. Let's think number three about the conscience in the Christian life. What about the practical application of how this meets the road of my everyday life? My applications that I want us to consider work first of all in you. I wanna look at the conscience in your home. I wanna look at the conscience in our church. I want us to consider the conscience in the public square. I want us to consider the conscience in eternity. And we'll do each one very briefly. Practical applications. What about the conscience in you? We must be very aware of our own consciences, the state of our soul and our own sinful tendencies. One application point is that we ought to be careful to do or to stay away from what I mentioned earlier, which is how we can project our own guilty consciences onto the motives of other people around us. Another that I have found as a pastor to be very common in the church at large, if not our church, but the church in general, is this. We need to be very careful that we don't use, quote, liberty of conscience as a cover-up to live in rebellion and lawlessness. Paul addresses this in Romans, and I believe it's very prevalent in our day. The attitude goes something like this. Don't bind my conscience. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I can do whatever I want to do, however I want to do. And listen, we don't get in the floor and pitch a fit like a child. We often cover it with very pious and religious language, and we know how to smooth it over with the right theological words. But if we're not careful, we can use this idea of conscience to say, I'll do me, you do you, and I'm going to live in lawlessness and do whatever I want to do. And anybody who doesn't is nothing more than a legalist. The London Baptist Confession says those who use Christian liberty as an excuse to practice any sin or nurture any sinful desire pervert the main objective of the grace of the gospel to their own destruction and they completely destroy the purpose of Christian liberty. This purpose is that we, having been delivered from the hands of all our enemies, may serve the Lord without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. So we want to be careful about hiding a rebellious heart behind the smokescreen of, quote, liberty of conscience. But I want to address another couple of issues pastorally because I think that they're so practical and so relevant to our lives. I have found it very, very common for a believer to be plagued by an overly scrupulous conscience. What do you mean by that? How do you treat a conscience that tends to haunt you as a believer and treat you overly harsh, being overly scrupulous. I've seen this really play out at the Lord's table where 1 Corinthians 11 says that a man ought to examine himself before he comes to the table. But if we're not careful, we'll come to the Lord's table with an overly scrupulous conscience and we'll plunder through every sin in our souls and think that we are completely excuse from coming to the Lord's table because we're so unworthy and every, every little thing that we think of plagues us into a state of paralysis. And we must be careful. So you say, my conscience is constantly an enemy to me. So I want to ask you, first of all, how do we handle this? Well, first, we need to ask our own selves right now, is there unconfessed sin in my life? 
Maybe it's that my conscience isn't being overly harsh. Maybe it's doing its job and God's trying to pull out sin from our hearts like dross, like impurities from gold. But it also could be as well that we could be in our humility. Maybe your humility is pride in disguise. Have you ever heard or said something like this? You know, I think God forgives me, but I just can't forgive myself. I just can't forgive myself. I don't know what every person means by those words, but I do think that we need to be careful with that idea. Because what that could mean is that I'm gonna show myself as humble, but in fact, you see, what Jesus Christ did on the cross to forgive my sin and absorbing the fullness of God's wrath as the Son of God, that's not good enough to forgive my sin. You see, I'm gonna have to pay for my sin myself. I'm gonna have to punish myself. I'm gonna have to bear this one because what Jesus did isn't enough to deal with it. Is there a more arrogant statement? Is there a more, is there a more extensive invitation given to sinners to say, come to me and rest in the righteousness of Christ? It could be that many believers do have an overly harsh or scrupulous conscience. And I want to encourage you to work that out with your pastor, with fellow church members to begin to understand in ways that maybe your conscience is condemning you according to things that Scripture does not condemn you for. And with maturity and walking with the Lord, that can be worked out so that you can rest in Christ, so that you can have a forgiven conscience. It's been said that unconfessed sin is a festering sore. The terrors of conscience are a little Hell, a preview of what's to come. I want to move now and more quickly look at application of the conscience in the home. What are some ways that we can practically apply this in our families? I want to encourage families this morning to live in good conscience with one another. I want to encourage husbands and wives and siblings toward one another that we would make a fresh commitment to deal with sin quickly in our homes as it comes up, to as soon as weeds sprout out, not to water them, but to pull them, not fertilize them, that they turn into a jungle. Proverbs says, don't be easily offended. The scriptures teach us how to deal with sinful thoughts and attitudes that can fester and frustrate. In our homes, we ought to be quick to humbly repent, to get used to asking forgiveness from the people around us, to graciously bear with one another in our sins. I want to encourage all of our families to seek to live in fellowship with one another on a daily basis, to let joy reign in your house. When you have a disagreement over conscience, go to the scriptures. Parents, I want to encourage us and our children and many of you have grandchildren. Did you know that God has put a wonderful gift to you in your children? God's called you to train your children and he's given them minds and affections, but he's also given them a conscience. And we ought to steward that properly because when they sin, God is going to stricken their conscience. And as Christians, we know how to train them according to that conscience to use that gift that's in them to show them their sin and to present them with the glorious salvation of Jesus Christ and all of his forgiveness to cultivate our conscience. Next, I want to look to the church. I want us to think about how this applies in the church. On one hand, in the church, we have to learn where to allow for liberty of conscience. I am not the Lord of your conscience. The person sitting next to you is not the Lord of your conscience. 
God is the Lord of the human conscience and God alone. Fellow brothers and sisters are not the Lord of your conscience and the government is not the Lord of your conscience. But what we do want to do is inform one another in our consciences. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. On one hand, and I do think this is very important for our church right now to grasp. On one hand, it is very important that if we're going to walk together in unity and love, we have to have close confessional alignment together as a church. We have a confession of faith that lays out doctrinally what we believe as a church. It's very important that we come together closely under our confession of faith. We have core values as a church pertaining to the things that we believe about the home, about the church, about our relationship with the civil magistrate, and it is very important that we're all in the same boat and we're going in the same direction if we're going to preserve the unity that we have and walk together in love. But at the same time, in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul seems to be comfortable to an extent with a fair amount of variety within a local church. As I've often said, you don't have to be exact twins in order to be brothers. There are issues that we don't have to agree on on everything. One day, God's going to straighten all of us out. And one day, you're going to be wrong on things, and I'm going to be wrong on things And the problem is we don't know what those things are right now because if we did, we would change our minds. I have blind spots in my life. The only problem is I don't know where they are. You say, preacher, I know where they are. Let's talk after lunch. I know where yours are too. Let's talk. How can we walk together in love and unity and alignment but at the same time, leave liberty and how can we not become stumbling blocks to the consciences of other people? In 1 Corinthians 8, 9, there are some in the church that had a weak conscience. It appears that what's going on here is that their conscience was weak in the sense that it was misinformed. The alarm went off when there wasn't, in fact, a danger because of their Previous background in Judaism with eating food sacrificed to idols. And so their alarm bells are going off when in fact there are things that maybe they could be enjoying. But there's also another problem here. There are things in the church that maybe some people can enjoy because they're not sin but can be freely enjoyed before God, but there could be others in the church that cannot enjoy those same things. And the reason is there could be a previous history and a background to where if they partake of a certain activity, they could be lured back into idolatry and immorality. So when you put it all together, Paul says, be careful that you don't become a stumbling block over which people will trip over you and fall from their faith on their face. But at the same time, we have to be very careful that we don't restrict all of our liberty in Christ that God has given us to freely enjoy just because it might offend someone. We live in the nation of the offended. Everybody is offended about something. Pastor, I was offended over that sermon. Congratulations, a lot of people have. You offended me. I offended you. Everybody's offended about something. And sometimes we need to confess sin, and other times we just need to get over ourselves. But we have to learn to walk together in love, not restricting one another in straight jackets, and also being careful to respect one another's consciences. R.C. Sproul put it this way. The manipulation of conscience can be a destructive force within the Christian community. When we impose false guilt on others, 
We paralyze our neighbors, binding them in chains where God has left them free. But when we urge false innocence, we expose them to the judgment of God. Some have overly scrupulous con consciences, others have more loose consciences and maybe tend to justify their sinful consciences. We need to take that all before the Lord, before one another and before scripture. Next, and I'll move quickly, but the conscience in the public square. We live in a day where the conscience has been trampled on in the public square. Well, we ought to enjoy liberty of conscience to worship the one true God in Jesus Christ and to worship freely and essentially every Lord's day. Such faith cannot be coerced and it should not be suppressed. Jesus Christ is Lord of the conscience. That's an entire sermon in itself, but then I wanna conclude by looking at the conscience in eternity. Look back with me in Acts chapter 23, verse one. The Puritans wrote much on this issue. Did you know that the unbeliever who is outside of Christ will never escape his conscience? For the person who is outside of Jesus Christ in saving faith, I believe the Bible teaches that they will be forever tormented in their conscience. When your conscience strickens you, it is only a foretaste of a living hell that you will suffer under for all eternity. It's only a small preview of a wider hell that you will suffer under forever. The unbeliever will never escape a guilty conscience. He will suffer under the wrath of God for all eternity, his conscience will condemn him and his conscience before God will be right on every condemnation before God. But for the believer in Christ who repents and trusts in Christ alone and seeks to live in fellowship before him and glorify God and enjoy him forever, and who knows where to take his sin and knows where to wash his conscience, seeking to live in holiness, did you know that forever we will enjoy in glory a cleansed conscience before God that will never stricken us again because our defense attorney steps in and says, 1 John 2, 1, this one is with me. I have taken care of his dirty conscience. This one is trusting in me and you cannot mess with him. Can we say with Paul, before kings, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. You say no one can ever live in perfectly good conscience. There's always some sort of sin that would strike us rightly. And that's true. But so far as we can help it, we want to seek to live with a good conscience. Acts 24, 16, I always strive to have a clear conscience toward God and men. I want to end by addressing the question that someone's thinking right now. My conscience is plaguing me and I cannot get out of here fast enough. How long do I have to sit here and listen to this? But before you go, I want you to understand the importance of God's law that we stated at the beginning of the service. God's law crushes our consciences and accuses it rightly because we can never fulfill the demands that it places on our lives. And when we humbly present ourselves before God with nothing in and of ourselves to bring to him. The sweet offer of the gospel is that Christ fulfills those demands in our place so that we can sing with God when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who put an end to all my sins.
When you're singing before the Lord on Sunday morning and you hear the enemy saying, put that hand down, you know exactly what you did before you walked into here. We can say, look at Christ because I am with him. And one day, one day it's all gonna end with conscience. John Bunyan wrote a classic work called The Pilgrim's Progress. And at the very end, a man by the name of Mr. Honest is about to cross the River Jordan. And he asked good conscience to meet him there at the river. And it was good conscience that helped him all the way through the final trial of death to cross over to the end. Nathaniel Vincent said that a good conscience steals a man's heart with courage. A good conscience makes a man fearless before his enemies. Paul earnestly beheld the council. He was not afraid to face them because his conscience was clear. Nay, we read that Felix the judge trembled while Paul the prisoner was confident. The reason was because the judge had a bad conscience, but the prisoner being acquitted by a good conscience did not tremble but rejoiced at the thoughts of judgment to come. Paul said, my conscience is clear. You know how I conducted myself among you. But even though my conscience is clear, I'm not my judge and you're not my judge. God is the judge of my conscience. And God is the one that will lay it bare before all men on that day. And as we prepare for that day, may we incline our hearts to him trusting in him, cultivating our conscience in him, and may we glorify God and enjoy him forever with a clean and clear conscience, captive to the word of God, in love with the spirit of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for washing our consciences with your word. We thank you for the forgiveness that you freely offer and the burdens that you remove from our shoulders. We desire to do your will, but we are desperately needy for your strength. We pray, God, we pray that as weary pilgrims come in here this morning, Father, I'm aware that there are as many problems in this room as there are people, including me. And every person is coming in here with different concerns and problems and burdens. Father, I pray in this moment that you would wash over us by your spirit and refresh the souls of your saints in an unmistakable way. God, I pray that you would show yourself to your people in this moment through your word, through your spirit, that your fountain would be rich. God, wash over us, we pray, that we would drink the waters of salvation and that we would find them sweet, that we would find them strong, and that we would find them sufficient for our souls and all of our troubles. God, would you give rest to your people? I pray that your word would strengthen your people. Help us to walk together in our families. Help us to walk together in love and unity as a church. Help us to think rightly in the world. Help us to prepare for eternity. God, would you strengthen the arms of your people in an unmistakable way that we're rejuvenated, that we're trusting in you and not ourselves and that you refresh us by streams of water. Father, thank you for the life-giving sustenance of your word and that we find in one another. Lord, help us to humble one and ourselves before you and each other. And we pray that this would be a wonderful day of rest, physically and spiritually. Bless your people. Thank you for them.
Thank you for your patience toward me and your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.